Okay. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to yet another program from the Maratwada chapter of SFM. Uh, at the very onset, um, uh, I welcome you all, and uh, I also my uh, warm welcome to Dr. Ashok Khurana, our mentor emeritus. He's actually logged in. Uh, we are fortunate for that. Dr. T. L. N. Praveen, our president. Uh, Dr. Krishna Gopal, our secretary. See, all of them have logged in, and I welcome them all for this uh, uh, evening. Now, this is actually the last meeting which is being conducted uh, uh, with me as the president of uh, Marathwada chapter. And I had, I mean, so I take this opportunity to uh, say that I've had a wonderful uh, three years, and I had a great team to work with. With uh, uh, Dr. Shilpa, Sujit, uh, and uh, Veena, and Rinku. So uh, we really did a one, uh, wonderful job in spite of, we had some wonderful on-site meetings before the COVID came in. And then uh, we had a lot of virtual meetings, uh, a lot of focus programs. Uh, one of our programs, which was on uh, You Ask, We Answer, was uh, a big hit. So, uh, but... Uh, Okay, you know, leading a team uh, is uh, good because if you have a very good team, uh, they do all the hard work and then uh, uh, because you are leading the team, you get a lot of credit for that. So I'm really thankful to Shilpa and Sujit for all the efforts they have taken. But any association, you know, it's like a marathon. Uh, it's like a relay, relay race where uh, uh, the winning is not, uh, you miss be the first uh, runner, but uh, you know that necessarily does not mean uh, that you're going to win the race. Uh, so it is every person who comes over later uh, is equally important. So you have to pass on the baton to someone who's good. And I'm really fortunate that I would be uh, passing it on to a very close friend and a very, very dynamic uh, Dr. Anirudh Kulkarni, who would be taking over as the next president. Mm -hmm. And again, he has a wonderful team to work with, uh, with Dr. Shilpa as the next vice president, Sujit as the next secretary, and Veena as the treasurer. And we have great executive members in uh, Dr. Pansambar, Dr. Vishnu Adhani, Dr. Balaji Khanapure, and Dr. Sudhir Hirve. I take this opportunity to welcome our colleagues from Sholapur, and from Khandesh, uh, who now officially are a part of this chapter. So I welcome you all. And uh, we're also going to have some uh, co-opted uh, representation coming from these areas. So uh, with this, uh, from 1st of April, we have this new body is going to be taking over. And I'm very, very sure that in the next two years, you're going to see a lot of academics and uh, very uh, well programmed events coming up with uh, this wonderful team that uh, has been nominated for the next two years. With this, we begin the program. And uh, we, you know, we thought that there are certain vascular findings. Uh, of course, a single umbilical artery was something which was regularly being seen. But then uh, LSVC, ARSA, and PROOF, these were things uh, four or five years back, nobody actually bothered to look for. But since the time the knowledge has increased, they have started looking for it. They have started picking it up. And so ignorance is bliss. So as long as you're not uh, picking it up, you're very, very fortunate. But once you pick it up, it becomes very important for you to know what to do with that. How are you going to counsel the patient? Because once you <laughs> jot it down on paper, you have to answer a few questions. And that is why we thought, let us take these findings and see whether they are just normal variants or they, you know, they have some significance and how we need to go about what information we need to give to the uh, parents. And so we have, uh, you know, Dr. T. L. N. Praveen with us today, and uh, you know, I, uh, I'm introducing all my fac uh, faculties right now. Dr. T. L. N. Praveen does not require any introduction, so. And he is the president of the Society of Fetal Medicine, one of the finest teachers of fetal ultrasound. A very, very, uh, you know, uh, he's attached to the Marathwada chapter emotionally. 
and has been uh, you know uh, one of our favorites all along and he's never said no to us whenever we called him and so we welcome him then we have dr shilpa satarkar uh, she is the vice president uh, she was the secretary she is the secretary now but she'll taking over as the vice president again a very very popular national faculty and she's going to take us through the, the single umbilical artery and then we have dr sujit kontkar he's an obstetrician with special interest in fetal medicine practicing in aurangabad a very very dynamic personality and he is uh, you know taking over as the secretary for the next two years and you know i'm really really expecting him to do wonders uh, in the next two years because the secretary's role is the most important i feel in any kind of a, a organization and then uh, we have dr bimal sani that is myself again i don't need any introduction so shall i introduce, <laughs> shall I introduce I, you <laughs> so i i am leaving as the president i'm the outgoing president of marathwada chapter and i would be taking over as the national president from 1st of april so uh, with this we start with our program and uh, to begin with we have dr shilpa satarkar i request her to share her screen and uh, give us an insight into what we need to do with a single umbilical artery thank you sir uh, i'll be sharing the screen so am i audible and uh, uh, the slides are visible sir yeah 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 is good uh, thank you very much uh, uh, at the onset uh, i welcome uh, kurana sir and tln pravin sir and sani sir and all uh, the marathwada uh, delegates who have come from our marathwada chapter and all over from the world i see some from argentina and other places so welcome all uh, so uh, to begin with we'll start with uh, the uh, single umbilical artery so let's see if the single umbilical artery is just a variant or a, or something really more So, as we know that the umbilical cord contains two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein, and the umbilical form uh, cord is formed between 30 to 38 week of conception because the increased need for the fetus for growth. And then the single umbilical artery we define as absence of one of the umbilical arteries, and this is the most common macroscopic anomaly of the placenta, and most common malformation of the umbilical cord. how common it is so the incidence is between 0.5 to 5% in pregnancy and basically the incidence depend on the population which is studied so if the population studies is a targeted population who is for cvs then the uh, incidence is quite high but in unselected population at anomaly scan it is around 0.48% and it is very common in the twins so how the uh, umbilical artery becomes uh, like absent how the sua is formed so basically it is because of the primary uh, genesis of one of the umbilical artery or it could be secondary atrophy or atresia of the previously normal developed umbilical artery or it could be persistence of the original allantoic artery of the body stock the commonest uh, uh, theory postulated is the secondary atrophy or atresia of the previously normal developed umbilical artery that means the umbilical artery is developed and because of some reason it goes in either atrophy and atresia and how uh, this was uh, like confirmed that so on hp of the sua bc muscular remnants of the atrophic umbilical artery and therefore atrophy is considered as one of the commonest uh, causes so what is this now allantoic artery so uh, uh, if we go to the fetal circulation embryonic circulation rather in very early stage uh, say at uh, post conception around uh, 25 to 35 days there are two type of circulation one is the uh, vital line circulation and then is the uh, second is the allantoic circulation so what happens the yolk sac blood vessels develop in this yolk sac and then these blood vessels supply the embryo but the embryo is growing so fastly the metabolism is so fast that this whatever is thing uh, is there in the vital in the yolk sac it is insufficient so for that the allantoic membrane develops and in this allantoic membrane there are allantoic vessels these vessels uh, connect to one side to the umbilical cord which develops from the descending aorta here and the other side it connects to the uh, placenta the chorion where uh, the exchange takes place so in early stage there is this uh, yolk sac uh, forming the uh, vital line uh, circulation then the uh, amniotic at the allantoic sac develops it develops rapidly and then it fuses with the this uh, trophoblastic tissue and then the placenta is formed and then the blood supply to this comes from the 
umbilical arteries and when the blood supply is taken over by this umbilical artery the yolk sac and the uh, vitalin circulation decreases uh, like it regresses so how do the umbilical arteries develop so as we have seen the uh, the, pre the primitive is the uh, vitalin arteries which arise directly from the aorta and then as the requirement increased from here the allantoic membrane develops and in this allantoic membrane then uh, the vessels of previous uh, the primitive allantoic vessels develop and the, as the aorta descends after the development the umbilical arteries are formed which go in this allantoic um, allantoic uh, sac or membrane and then definitive allanto placental circulation is established so what can happen where where things can go wrong so if this is developed and suddenly if one of the umbilical arteries go in atresia or atrophy then what will happen in the very early developing stage because the heart is uh, primitive it is not well developed it is in developing stage these pressure changes may depress uh, disrupt the embryonic uh, hemodynamics and this will lead to uh, various uh, cardiac anomalies as well as because the blood vessels are not uh, developed because of these pressure changes which suddenly occur many organs may have uh, altered blood supply decreased blood supply and that will lead to various anomalies secondly the umbilical arteries will not at all form if the umbilical arteries don't form then the supply to the fetus and everything should be there the food supply and everything should be there so now the vital in artery take over the function of the umbilical arteries and then the vital line placental circulation is formed because of this what happens the distal part of the aorta is not formed or it becomes hypoplastic and then we get multiple caudal anomalies and third thing which occur is at the umbilical ring level so because of these disruptions in this uh, level at the umbilical cord formation or the umbilical ring the it affects the uh, formation of the anterior abdominal wall and this leads to various anomalies of the anterior abdominal wall the most commonly being the uh, body stock anomaly so depending on the number of the vessels in the uh, umbilical artery we have type of classification commonest is this type 1 classification where the allantoic means the left or the right umbilical artery is either absent in type 2 which is very rare around 1.5% we have seen that the vital line takes over the function the vital line artery in the postnatal life becomes the uh, superior mesenteric artery but as the umbilical arteries are not formed when the vital line takes we see that it causes various malformation of the caudal in part of the fetus like synomalia caudal degeneration and anal agenesis and these are very rare anomalies so uh, in the fetus in nearly 98% of the uh, suf fetus at one point there are two umbilical arteries so either one of them get atrophies if this occurs in early embryogenesis then it leads to single umbilical artery with structural defect and if the occlusion occurs after embryogenesis it will lead to isolated single umbilical artery and uh, associated with uh, structural defect will be very very less and when the persistent vital line artery remains because the umbilical is not developed it acts as a single umbilical artery we have seen that and that inserts into the aorta or the sma and therefore on uh, the sagittal section of the fetus we see this umbilical artery now connecting directly to the aorta and once it connects directly to the aorta the distal portion becomes atrophic here you can see the diameter of this uh, aorta while the diameter of this or then the, there will be total atrophy of the aorta and this will lead to vascular steel it can be associated with uh, aneuploidy like uh, features and then all will have definitely severe caudal anomalies this is a case of serinomelia where you can see this is a single umbilical artery and as this umbilical artery is now directly connecting to the aorta this is a case of uh, caudal dysgenesis where you can see that uh, uh, this is the single umbilical artery which is again arising directly from aorta so caudal dysgenesis here you can see this is a postnatal this is the first trimester diagnosis it was ambiguous genitalia and there was a smooth perineum and this was the cyst associated with the caudal dysgenesis so in this these are both are the vital line uh, arteries which have taken function as the umbilical arteries so uh, when do we evaluate how do we evaluate the umbilical cord when do we evaluate the umbilical cord so iscg practice guidelines of 2013 and 2010 says that in t1 the umbilical cord evaluation is not recommended and in t2 it is optional while the aium uh, recommends to evaluate the umbilical cord plus the number of vessels whenever possible so usually we evaluate in the second or the third trimester first trimester evaluation is considered difficult because of the small arteries of uh, because the vessels are of small size while uh, if we do tvs with a bidirectional uh, power doppler this definitely increases the detection rate of the umbilical arteries compared to the um, the that rate detection rate is definitely comparable to the second trimester so as we are shifting to the first trimester anomalies can the detection of the 
uh, umbilical arteries, the evaluation of the number of vessels is very important and that should be done on TVS with bidirectional flow because on TA at times it becomes very difficult and there are chances of false positive diagnosis. So uh, how do the umbilical, a single umbilical artery look on ultrasound? So in the cross section of a free floating loop, we see the two vessels which are compared to a uh, soda can tab appearance. So this is what is the soda can tab. Here, this is the umbilical vein and this is the umbilical artery. And then we can see it in the coiled form or in the straight form. And on the uh, pelvic scan uh, around the bladder, we see only one umbilical artery. Then uh, there are pitfalls in this. Uh, counting of the umbilical uh, vessels when it is hypercoiled or where the when the coils are very much close to placely, closely placed to each other, it's very difficult. So the intra-abdominal vessel counting is definitely more informative and more diagnosis, diagnostic. <clears throat> but again, there is a variation uh, which is called as a fused uh, umbilical arteries. So here you get uh, two vessel cord at one uh, side and three vessel cord at one part in the same fetus. So why this occurs? It occurs because the uh, umbilical arteries get fused near the placental end. So at placental end, uh, uh, near proximal, just proximal to placental end, it is two vessel cord. While in the uh, fetal part, in around the uh, urinary bladder, this is the three vessel cord. And this variation is called as a fused umbilical arteries. Then there is one variation which is called as hypoplastic arteries, which we need to evaluate as a single umbilical artery. So here basically three, both the umbilical arteries are present, but there is gross disparity in their size and the blood flow. And then when the size uh, is more than, the difference is more than 50% or 25%, or if the diameter is more than two, difference is more than two millimeter, then we define that as the hypoplastic umbilical arteries. And then it is considered as a variant of uh, SUA only. So we need to evaluate that way. Hypoplastic arteries are very difficult to pick on color doctor and they are better picked up on the gray scale imaging where we see that them very clearly. Now, is it possible to have a single umbilical artery in T1 and SUA, uh, the three vessel cord in T1 and SUA in T2 or vice versa? Yes, it is definitely possible because this can occur because of the secondary atresia or atrophy of a previously normal umbilical artery, which we see in the first trimester. And in first trimester, it could be it could happen that because of very small diameter of the uh, umbilical artery, we were not able to see that, and therefore we labeled it as uh, a single umbilical artery. And then in the second trimester, when they developed very properly with proper size, then we could uh, we we found that there were three umbilical artery. So this is possible in the uh, fetus. Now, when uh, when will you see that the umbilical artery is isolated or non-isolated? So non-isolated means it is associated with structural abnormalities, chromosomal abnormalities, and then certain growth-related pathologies. And uh, when the single umbilical artery uh, has no additional chromosomal or structural abnormalities, then we say that it is a single umbilical, isolated single umbilical artery. So uh, the structural abnormalities associated are most common are the cardiac and the GUT. Why cardiac? I said you, because of the sudden disruption um, that causes pressure changes. So uh, this is one uh, this hypothesis. The other hypothesis, like uh, the genetic uh, causes or the environmental causes, also there. But this is one of the cause which is postulated. Then the common other common uh, system involved is the GUT, GIT, and the CNS. And then the less common uh, involved are the diaphragmatic uh, hernia. And uh, this is the list of the uh, anomalies which is associated. And this is the long list of the various uh, systems and their anomalies, which I won't go in detail. And then we have to remember that the single umbilical artery has definite association with placental and umbilical cord insertion, which we uh, uh, never see or we really forget to see. So we have to see for filamentous insertion, abnormal short cord, circumvallate placenta, and placenta previa. So these are very much associated with the single umbilical artery. Then when you say, uh, when you find a SUA with anomaly, then the prognosis depends on the anomaly. We have to look for additional anomalies and SUA associated with anomaly, a karyotype is to be uh, suggested in these uh, cases. And when we find SUA with minor markers like ECF or the mild pyliacasis or CPC, then uh, depending on whatever is the um, soft marker, we have to recalculate or readjust the uh, uh, priority risk. Or if we detect, for example, say ECF in the first trimester, then we have to go for dual marker. If required, quadruple screening is to be done. And if all the screening is negative, we have to treat the, this as an isolated uh, SUA. And there is no need of invasive uh, test in such type of SUA with uh, minor markers. And then uh, cardiac anomalies are seen in nearly 5% of the SUA. But 
the referral of fetal echo is not indicated if you have done a very proper extended basic cardiac examination which includes visualization of the four chamber heart with the umbilical uh, with the pulmonary veins and the outflow tracts and the arch view if we evaluate the heart properly then there is no need for a uh, 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 like echo in uh, patients with ACO in fetal cells with ACO so now uh, if there is SUA and then it is associated with very early FGR in the second trimester, we know that second trimester early FGR can be commonly associated with uh, aneuploidy. So at that time, we have to very carefully look for any missed anomalies. We have to do the color Doppler and see about the umbilical, uh, the placental insufficiency and the other thing. And then we need to treat this as a non-isolated SUA and discuss the karyotyping you know, option of karyotype with the patient. And then we need to follow up depending on what uh, what is the outcome. And then uh, is the absent side of the umbilical artery and its association with malformation, is it important? So it practically doesn't matter in clinical practice, but it is found that the left uh, umbilical artery is more commonly absent and it is more associated with the anomalies. But in practice, it really doesn't matter. The association of trisomy 18 with SEO is very common. Less common is 13 triploidy turners and microdilation. And with uh, trisomy 21, uh, SUA association is very, very less. But uh, when we see that there is a single defect with a CUA, then the chances of chromosomal abnormalities is nearly 4%, which increases to nearly 50% with multiple defects. And when we see nothing, and uh, like if it is we label it as isolated SUA, then again, karyotype is not indicated. Now, as we are shifting towards the first trimester anomaly scan, if we find SUA at the 11 to 14 week scan, we know that it has high association with trisomy 18 and as trisomy 18 is associated with multiple anomalies and we are definitely going to detect that in the first trimester. But if we see as uh, only a single umbilical artery and no major defects, then uh, we need to uh, suggest the combined screening. Uh, which is commonly uh, a routine protocol in the Western world. But here we have to suggest that he has to go for combined screening. And then we have to ask this patient to come for an early anomaly scan at 16 to 17 weeks, where we can uh, find out the minor, like uh, the anomalies like overlapping fingers, facial cleft, and the cardiac anomalies. Then uh, SEO associated with growth pathology. Yes, there is a lot of controversy in the literature. But many, uh, the recent 2019 and 2021 meta-analysis say that yes, the growth-related pathologies like SGA, FGR, PIH, IUDs, perinatal mortality are quite high with SUAs. So we have to go for a growth scan. And then the additional advantage is that we can pick the uh, evolving anomalies in this growth scan also. What is the pregnancy outcome with isolated single umbilical heart? So the preterm deliveries, again, are very common because of the risk of PROM, placenta previa, or placental abruption, and PIH. In the neonates, in 10 to 15% of the uh, neonates which uh, have SUA, they, 10 to 15% of them have minor anomalies, which are self-limiting. And the long-term outcome for physical and neurological development is same as that for the uh, normal children. So now SUA in twins, it is very common with twins. Usually, a single twin is affected. In this screen, IUGR is more common and more, more severe rather because uh, the compensatory hypertrophy or compensatory increase in the size of the umbilical or single umbilical artery doesn't occur. And therefore, IUGR is more common. And the uh, single umbilical artery affects mono or dichoronic in the same way. So in a um, twin with SUA, we need to watch for the FGR irrespective of the chorionicity. The recent 2021 SM, the SMFM recommendations uh, are that in an isolated single umbilical artery, there is no need for additional evaluation. While in the third trimester, in an SUA, we need to go for a weekly antenatal fetal surveillance, which begins at the 36 uh, weeks onwards. But to conclude, in isolated uh, SUA, we have to do a very careful scan. We have to look for the fetus in detail, specifically concentrating on the fetal heart, GUT, musculoskeletal, and importantly, placenta. We should not forget the placenta. Then we need to go for the growth scans. And what things we don't need to do is that we don't we have we don't uh, take it that SUA for granted. We will never scare the patient that yes yes you are having SUA. We have to evaluate and then do the counseling of the patient. If we find that yes it is a isolated SUA, there is no need of amniocentesis, and then neurological investigations in the asymptomatic newborns are not indicated if, it, if the if uh, means we, we don't need it in the uh, newborn uh, fetuses. And thank you very much for your patient listening. Uh, in a short time, you've taken us 
uh, through all the aspects and all the factors that can be associated with the single umbilical artery. Uh, we'll take the questions uh, at the end during the interactive se uh, session with, with Dr. Anirudh Kulkarni. Uh, so now I invite Dr. Sujit Konkar to uh, share his slide and give his presentation on uh, persistent right umbilical vein. Good evening, colleagues and seniors. At the outset, I would like to thank. Uh, Go on full screen. Yeah. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Society of Fetal Medicine, Central Body, and my local chapter, so Marathwada chapter, for giving me this opportunity. So my talk is on persistent right umbilical vein. So before uh, going to this persistent right umbilical vein, we must know what is a normal left umbilical vein. So here we should know two important things. One is the course of the left umbilical vein, and another is the location of gallbladder. This is the transverse section of fetal abdomen at the level of stomach and uh, umbilical vein. This is the entry of umbilical into the, into the abdomen. After giving the inferior segmental branch, it is called the umbilical segment of left portal vein. After this, it abruptly turns towards right at 90 degree. And now this is called as pars transversa. So pars transversa gives rise to ductus venosus in the straight line in the umbilical vein. So what happens next? So there is a junction between pars transversa and main portal vein giving rise to this X sign. This can be X, this can be H, or this can be T depending on the portal configuration. So here, main portal vein, then left portal vein, right portal vein giving rise to two branches, anterior right portal vein, and posterior right portal vein. Next to see is location of gallbladder. So you can see here, the gallbladder is located in the right upper quadrant of the fetal abdomen. It is towards right side or lateral to the insertion of umbilical vein. So coming to the classification system of the fetal venous system anomalies, it is categorized or classified into four types. Anomalies of cardinal veins consist of complex malformations, which are seen in heterotaxy syndromes, or those can be isolated malformations like double inferior vena cava, persistent left superior vena cava, or interrupted IVC. Anomalies of umbilical veins consist of a genesis of ductus venosus with intra or extra hepatic shunts and persistent right umbilical vein with or without ductus venosus. Anomalies of white line veins contains total or partial a genesis of portal system, portal venous system. And fourth is anomalous pulmonary venous connection, which can be total or partial. So today we are talking about persistent right umbilical vein, which is anomaly of umbilical veins. The persistence of a right portal vein rather than normal left-sided portal vein is called persistent intrahepatic right portal vein. In few cases, it is found as supernumerary vein. It is important to know and remember that its persistence does not alter the blood flow distribution to the fetus. The incidence put by various studies is one in 500, that is 0.2%. The commonest etiology put forward is a thromboembolic event from placenta in a left uh, umbilical vein during early period of embryogenesis, which obstructs the left umbilical vein and keeps patency of the right umbilical vein. Various teratogenic agents like retinoic acid also have been proposed to be cause of this. And folic acid deficiency is also a proposed theory of the etiology of this flu. There are two types of persistent right umbilical vein. First is intrahepatic type, which is more common, seen in 95% of cases. Here, the umbilical vein connects to right portal vein instead of left. And here, in these cases, the ductus venosus is normally connected. And ectahepatic variety, which is seen in 5% of cases. Here, umbilical vein may bypass the liver and portal system and may abnormally drain into inferior vena cava or directly to fetal heart. This is something worrisome because many anomalies are seen in extrahepatic variety, and most of cases are having a genesis of ductus venosus. Now coming to embryology and pathology. Development of normal venous drainage is a complex process. At four weeks, paired umbilical veins carry blood from developing placenta to primitive heart. So the umbilical veins are shown by this green color, the orange colored are vitellin veins, and the blue colored are cardinal veins. This is the sinus venosus. So at five weeks, they join an anastomotic venous network 
formed by omphalocentric veins in the developing liver thereby establishing the umbilical portal venous connection by 6 weeks the right umbilical vein regresses and the left umbilical vein enlarges to accommodate the increasing flow now the umbilical vein enters the left portal vein directly here and the vast majority of blood flows through branches of the left and right portal veins through the liver sinusoids and to inferior vena cava through the hepatic veins development of ductus venosus however permits a portion of returning blood to flow directly from left portal vein to the systemic venous system after birth the intracorporeal umbilical vein obliterates to form ligamentum teres within the falciform ligament and the ductus venosus obliterates as a part of the fissure for ligamentum venosa the diagnosis of persistent right umbilical vein is not difficult but often it is overlooked here the umbilical vein goes towards the left side of the stomach rather than towards liver see this is the curvature of the umbilical vein is going towards the left side instead of right side and second thing is location of gallbladder the gallbladder is visualized medial to the umbilical vein normal lateral position gallbladder is seen towards the left side of the umbilical vein instead of right side it is medial medial side of the umbilical vein the umbilical vein connects to the right portal vein instead of left portal vein this is the video depicting the same thanks dr shilpa satarkar for this video you can see the curvature of umbilical vein it is going towards left side of body that is towards the stomach this is the schematic representation of normal left umbilical vein and persistent right umbilical vein normally the umbilical vein is curving towards the right side the gall bladder is seen towards the right or lateral to the umbilical vein while in persistent right umbilical vein the umbilical vein is curving towards the left side towards the stomach and the gall bladder is seen towards medial side or towards left side of the umbilical vein it is seen between stomach and umbilical vein in differential diagnosis you can think of umbilical vein varix gall bladder duplication abnormal course of portal vein and its branches and intrahepatic cysts but careful observation with use of curve doppler can uh, get your diagnosis of persistent right umbilical vein so coming to associated malformations usually persistent right umbilical vein is isolated but may have increased association with anomalies in other systems various studies have stated that the associated anomalies are seen in 25% of cases the extrahepatic type of persistent right umbilical vein is associated mostly with the anomalies the commonest anomalies seen are anomalies in gastrointestinal system cardiac anomalies anomalies in genito urinary system and single umbilical artery this is a very nice article published in uh, 2020 ultrasonic detection of fetal persistent right umbilical vein and incidence and significance of concomitant anomalies this is the largest study and data analysis of fetal persistent right umbilical veins uh, which is studied 756 uh, fetal persistent right umbilical vein uh, fetuses over the period of 10 years from 2007 to 2017 uh, all the fetuses were carefully examined sonography was done uh, ultrasound and uh, color doppler was done fetal echocardiography and detailed anatomic survey was done to find the concomitant anomalies so in this study the incidence of persistent right umbilical vein was 1.7% and the incidence of concomitant anomalies was 13.5% so here the commonest anomalies were seen in cardiovascular system in 40% of cases so 10 cases of ventricular septal defect and 9 cases of persistent left ventricular cava and single ventricle complete atrial ventricular canal defect common atrial trunk and transposition of great arteries were seen commonly nervous system anomalies were seen in 20% of cases where five cases of spina bifida and five cases of cardiac plexus cysts were seen along with other anomalies incidence of urinary system anomalies were seen in 15% of cases where five cases of unilateral or bilateral hydronephrosis and three cases each of unilateral duplex kidney and unilateral or bilateral regional anomalies and unilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney were seen along with some other findings in skeletal system you have got some cases of short term limbs and unilateral or bilateral club foot commonly club hand commonly in digestive system you have got the two cases of stenosis or atresia of small bowel two cases of esophageal atresia and one case of intestinal duplication in respiratory system you have got uh, one case each of cpam that is congenital pulmonary air malformation 
pulmonary sequestration, left lung agenesis, and left lung dysplasia. And this is the list of other anomalies. I have mentioned this study because this is the largest study of persistent right umbilical vein uh, done till date. What the genetics say here? When associate anomalies are uh, here, they are seen, then the underlying chromosomal aberrations are seen in 8% of cases. The common were trisomy 21 and trisomy 18. The risk of non chromosomal syndromes is relatively high in extrahepatic type as compared to interhepatic type. In the study, two cases of trisomy 18 were found. Prognosis of persistent right umbilical vein is a normal outcome if no other anomalies are identified. Prognosis is not good when associated anomalies are there, which is seen commonly in extrahepatic type. Obstetric management should not be altered in these cases. The take home message is isolated intrahepatic persistent right umbilical vein with normal ductus venous connection is usually a normal and variant with no clinical significance. Extrahepatic type is seen where all uh, other malformations are seen in other systems. So, whenever you suspect a case of persistent right umbilical vein, a thorough anatomical search is required to see the anomalies in other systems and isolated intrahepatic persistent right umbilical vein does not require any change in obstetric management. Thank you for this. Thank you, Sujit. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was uh, wonderful and crisp on the persistent right umbilical vein. Now, uh, Imanshu, do we break for uh, trade partner videos? So we have a three to four minutes break for trade partner videos, and then we'll come back with, with uh, Professor Teal and Praveen for another uh, important topic, and that is uh, ARSA. Welcome back. And uh, now we move to the next uh, vascular finding, and that is an aberrant right subclavian artery, which a few years back, uh, you know, we, we hardly knew about or we never looked for that. And then uh, since the time it became apparent that yes, it has some association with, uh, it uh, came as one of the markers for Down syndrome. Suddenly there's a lot of interest in aberrant right subclavian artery. But again, that is something which we just don't see it on your routine and to take us through on how to look for it and what is the significance of it? We have the, uh, Professor TLN Praveen. Uh, welcome him, and I request him to share his screen. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, Bimal. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, congratulations uh, for organizing such a wonderful meet as usual and uh, choosing such wonderful topics, uh, which are absolutely of clinical relevance. And uh, now let us discuss about uh, today's topic that is ARSA, which is quite often sounds very hep. In the sense, when you say ARSA, and I said, you say that you have diagnosed an ARSA, then it becomes very, very posh. So, but then basically we are more interested in identifying whether it's a normal variant or is it something to be worried about, which is what is going to be of great help in our clinical practice. Now, ARSA as such, as he has already said, that it is apparent right subclavian artery. It is also known as uh, apparent retroesophageal right subclavian artery, and also as at, uh, at, artery, arteria lusoria. Uh, the arteria lusoria basically because sometimes it can cause uh, obstruction or cause compression over the esophagus and result, results in dysphagia. That is the reason why it has been stated as arteries, arteria lusoria. Now, ARSA, as we all know, is a mid soft marker for chromosomal abnormalities, such as Down syndrome. And uh, it can also be detected in almost about 1% to 2% of normal fetuses. And that is the reason why its significance has become debatable. And in Down syndrome, uh, if you go through the systemic, uh, systematic reviews uh, and meta-analysis, which has been evaluated thoroughly in fetal diagnostic therapy in 2016, where they found that uh, the incidence in, in Downs, it's almost about 2.9 in some of the, uh, the publications, and it extended even up to 100%. So it is very, very variable, and is occasionally associated with uh, uh, 22Q11.2 uh, microdeletion, that is the Dijors uh, syndrome. So this is the basic background of ARSA. 
what are its clinical implications? Uh, basically, it can be categorized as isolated or non-isolated. When we say it is non-isolated, that means it is associated with certain other markers, other soft markers, or it is associated with certain structural abnormalities, or it is be associated with increased maternal age. And if it is associated with increased risk of first time to combine screening uh, as considered as non-isolated ARSA. And ARSA, when it is isolated as an ultrasound marker, it need not be further evaluated. This is a very clear message which I wanted to share is that an isolated ARSA doesn't require uh, any further evaluation. Whereas a non-isolated ARSA definitely needs further evaluation either with an invasive testing or by selfie DNA. So this is the basic concept that we need to take, uh, take it very clearly. Now, how about 22Q11 to microdeletion uh, and ARSA? Uh, Dijar syndrome is associated with congenital heart diseases, particularly the conotrunkal abnormalities, right side diota, double aortic arch. Rarely it is associated with ARSA as it has been stated in these two articles which have been published in 2020. Now, association of ARSA, when it is associated with a congenital heart disease, there is a high possibility of a, a micro deletion of 22Q11. So this is one thing which we have to keep in mind. So ARSA associated with a congenital heart disease has to be viewed, viewed with suspicion as far as the chromosomal abnormality is concerned. But ARSA as, as such, when it is isolated, you don't need to be really worried about it. Now, what is the pathology of this ARSA? We all know that the aberrant right subclavian artery is one of the most common anomalies in the aortic arch. The right aortic arch regresses between the right common carotid and the right subclavian artery. So this hinders the formation of the brachiocephalic artery, and which in turn results in the development of four branches from the left aortic arch, namely the right carotid artery, left carotid artery, left subclavian artery, and ARSA. That is the aberrant right subclavian artery. And so this aberrant right subclavian artery, which is developing from the descending aorta, has to cross from the left of the spine to the right shoulder behind the trachea and the esophagus. So that is the course that it takes. Now, basically, when you take into consideration the development of the arches, this is usually you have the double aortic arch, that is the right and the left aortic arch, and as well as the right ductus arteriosus and the left ductus arteriosus. During the normal development or abnormality, the regression is the one which causes all these problems. So if it is normally regressing, that is when the right abdominal the aortic arch uh, regresses along with the right ductal arch, then we have the normal configuration of the aortic arch. Whereas whenever there is a regression between the right subclavian and the right carotid artery, this is the one which results in the aberrant right subclavian. Whereas whenever there is a, a, a regression between the left carotid and the left subclavian, then we have what's called as the ALSA, which is basically been, uh, been developed from the commonal diverticulum. And whereas whenever there is a, a regression after the origin of left subclavian artery in the descending aorta, then it results in what is called as the mirror image branching, where you have two vessels on either sides. Or if it persists to be the same double aortic arch, then you have the double aortic arch configuration. So basically in ARSA, we have the descending aorta, ascending aorta, abnormal aortic arch. So abnormal, uh, aberrant right subclavian artery. So how do we image this ARSA? It's a little difficult unless you keep trying to uh, identify it. But then once you get the, the hang of it, I think it's not that even difficult to identify the ARSA in your three vessel trachea view or what is called as the subclavian artery view, which is also known as the bicycle handlebar view and also the coronal view of the upper mediastinum and then the sagittal views of the thorax. So these are the views that are being used in order to image ARSA. Basically, when you see here, this is the classical V, that is the triple uh, the three vessel trachea view, where you can see the trachea, you can see the aberrant right subclavian artery, which is just in front of the trachea. As you can see here also, you can see that the, the, uh, the trachea is right there and the aberrant right, I'm sorry, the right subclavian artery is in front of the trachea as you can see here. So this is the classical appearance of a, a normal right subclavian artery. This is one thing which I wanted to demonstrate very clearly so that tomorrow when you go back and try to evaluate, this is how we are going to look for and as far as this thing. This is what is called as the bicycle handlebar view in the upper mediastinum where you can see that it looks just like a, 
a bicycle handlebar, as you can see, and this is the bicycle handlebar. And also you can see them uh, very well demonstrating the right subclavian artery arising normally in, in front of the, the trachea. So these are the things that we, this also will help. And of course, when you do an arch view where you can see the ascending aorta, you can see the brachiocephalic artery, and then the left common carotid and, and the right common, right, uh, left common carotid and the left subclavian arteries. So this is the static image. Now, when you take a sagittal section, you also can see the arch. That is from the, the, uh, the uh, arch, that is the left ventricle, that is the left ventricle outflow track, ascending aorta, and you have the subclavian, uh, left common carotid and left subclavian arteries. Uh, so this is how the, the branches that, that is the, the branches of the aorta can be easily identified and the relationship of the, the right subclavian artery with the trachea is what is very important for us because that is the one which is going to usually help us in diagnosing an aberrant right subclavian artery. Now, as I said, the ARSA arises from the descending aorta. As you can see here, it arises from the descending aorta and courses retro tracheoesophageal before reaching the right shoulder, it occurs in almost about 80% of the cases. In about 15% of the cases, it may be seen between the esophagus and the trachea, and this is where it causes sometimes uh, the compression of the esophagus and results in the soria, that is the dysphagia. And rarely, it can also be anterior to the trachea. In that situation, your origin of the right subclavian artery, aberrant right subclavian artery from the descending artery is the one which clinches the diagnosis. Quite often, we depend upon the retrotracheal uh, location of the right subclavian, which tells us that it is a aberrant right subclavian artery. But sometimes when it, has, it is anterior to the trachea, you need to trace it back to the descending aorta, which can give you the answer of uh, aberrant right subclavian artery. So with this, then, well, yeah, okay, sorry, okay. So this is the classical one, where you can see the three vessel trachea view, that is the trachea, that is the aberrant right subclavian artery, which is just behind it. And this is the coronal section where you can see the answer arising from the descending aorta. This is how the descending aorta and it goes to the right shoulder. So these are the classical demonstrations of ARSA as far as the three vessel, as well as coronal view of the, uh, the coronal view of the uh, upper mediastinum, which definitely helps us in identifying the location that is retroitracheal or arising from the descending heart. So these are the two things which clinch the diagnosis. So these are the uh, images where you can see that there is a nice uh, uh, demonstration of the descending aorta, and that is the arsa that is arising from it. And I will like this. Okay. No, it's not. Okay. Anyway, this is the, uh, the left brachiocephalic and the right brachiocephalic, and that is the arsa that you can demonstrate in the retrotracheal region. Now, the uh, ARSA, as it is already, already known all, to all of us, that it's the second trimester soft marker. And uh, every soft marker in the second trimester has got some positive and negative likelihood ratios. The positive likelihood ratio for ARSA is about 21.4. And uh, the reason why we make use of these second trimester soft markers is to risk stratify the aneuploidy. So here we have positive likelihood ratios and uh, negative likelihood ratios of ARSA and estimated likelihood ratio of ARSA, that is when it is an isolated ARSA, and this is the likelihood ratio that we have to keep in mind. So when once you have that one, when you have a, uh, when you have to risk stratify based on these soft markers, what we need to do is, we need to multiply the sum of positive likelihood ratios with the sum of negative likelihood ratios. For example, in this patient, where we um, mid to scan reveals an echogenic focus in the left ventricle, also as well as the left superior, uh, superior vena cava, persistent left superior vena cava, as you can see here, that is the echogenic focus. When you take the positive uh, likelihood ratios of the, the ARSA as well as the, the echogenic focus, it is almost over 25, and negative likelihood ratios have to be calculated for all the soft markers, and uh, when you multiply the positive likelihood ratio with the negative likelihood ratio, the risk is almost 1 in 27.4. So five four. So the lesson which we have to learn here is that whenever you see a soft marker, quite often like an echogenic focus, which quite often we try to neglect or ignore it. But then basically when you see one soft marker, I think it is essential for us and it is a lesson that we should learn that. And it is recommended that we should search for the other soft markers and based on that you need to risk stratify the uh, patient. Now there are certain risk calculators also available. 
which can also be used where you can use the first trimester screening, you can use all the markers and you can say yes or no, calculate and it gives you the uh, risk of one in 16. That, uh, so there are other easier methods by doing because every time you, don't need, you can't calculate all the, uh, do the mathematical models. Now, the key message to end, what I would like to say is presence of a second trimester soft marker prompts us to meticulously search for other soft markers and structural abnormalities because these are the two things that which, which will modify the risk stratification. Maternal age as well as the first trimester screening are additional factors which are required for, to be, which have to be considered and non-isolated. When I say non-isolated, the message is very clear that it is associated either with other soft markers or is it associated with structural abnormalities or is it associated with an increased maternal age or it is associated with uh, uh, first trimester screening, high risk for first trimester screening. So these are the things they, which will definitely um, risk modify in fact, these are the risk modifying factors and uh, counseling is whenever we find this sort of a non-isolated ARSA, the prenatal genetic workup is offered to the expectant parents with presence of uh, uh, other accompanying soft marker structural defects, advanced maternal age, high risk uh, um, first trimester screening. Whereas ARSA as an isolated marker needs no further evaluation. So we consider that as a normal variant and uh, whenever it is a non-isolated ARSA, we consider it as a uh, high risk uh, category. So with this, Thank you very much for patient listening. I hope I, can, I could convey the message which is very, very important for us in our day-to-day -day practice. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, sir. You made, uh, you know, I think you've, import, uh, you've answered a very, very important question which is there in everyone's mind that every time you see ARSA, do you really need to go ahead and do invasive testing? And uh, this, this was very important that uh, uh, you've made it very, very clear that, yes, we need to look at the overall picture and then take a call on that. Isolated, otherwise, we don't need to worry. Thank you very much, sir. With this, I'll share my screen and I'm going to take you through uh, uh, the fourth and the last uh, topic today, and that is on the persistent left superior vena cava, whether uh, it's a normal variant or is there something more to that? No, you know the, you know we'll start calling it as the PLSVC or the LSVC. So the this is LSVC is the most common variant of the thoracic venous system. The prevalence is estimated to be about 0.3 to 0.5 percent in the general population, but it occurs in four to eight percent in infants with CHD and up to nine percent of fetuses with CHD. Now this differentiation is more because some of the fetuses with complex CHD may get terminated or along with an LSVC may get terminated or uh, may die in utero. And that is why the incidence of an LSVC with CHD in the prenatal period is more than that in the uh, infants. Now there is a common association between the LSVC, intracardiac anomalies, extracardiac anomalies and aneuploidy. This is uh, this is there and that is where its importance comes in. But if you have an isolated persistent LSVC, we say there is, it has no clinical significance. So if you have ruled out any other cardiac anomaly, there is no extra cardiac anomaly. If it's only an isolated uh, LSVC, it really does not have a, you know, significant clinical significance. But then, it's still very, very important to know that there is an LSVC. Because, except one thing, a dial, you know, uh, an LSVC we know can be associated with, uh, uh, is associated with the dilated coronary sinus when it opens into the coronary sinus. And this dilated coronary sinus may cause compression of the AV node and the his bundle. And this can lead to cardiac arrhythmias, such as atrial or ventricular fibrillation. Now, a dilated coronary sinus may complicate a mitral valve surgery. In adults, it is important in cases of venous catheterization and pacemaker implantation. So for all this, it is important to know that yes, there is a persistent left superior vena cava. Otherwise, it, would, it could lead to a lot of catastrophe. And knowledge of that there is a 
the persistent lift superhypnic eva is fundamental in some cardiac surgeries i'm not going to get into the detail of that and that is the reason it's important that yes we should know that there is an lsvc even though if it is isolated because diagnosing an lsvc is more difficult in a postnatal echo as compared to the prenatal one now i i don't want to get too much into the embryology embryology of venous systems is always very very complicated but you know in simple words you have the right and the left cardinal veins which are have the anterior and the posterior branches and the right anterior cardinal vein becomes the right superior vena cava along with you know along with the right common cardinal vein whereas and then you have a transverse vein which develops forming the innominate or the left brachiocephalic vein and the left anterior cardinal vein gets regressed this is what happens normally but if there is a persistence of the left anterior cardinal vein and there is a failure of development of the left brachiocephalic vein you what you're going to get is the bilateral superior vena cava or if there is a persistence of the left anterior cardinal vein and there is obliteration of the right common and anterior cardinal vein then what you get is you get an lsvc or a persistent left superior vena cava with an absent right superior vena cava now with this in consideration let us see you know there is a persistent left superior vena cava if it is there with an rsvc in most of the cases you have it there you have an lsvc and there is an rsvc also that is what we call as bilateral svc there are now we always been thinking that yes this is always going to be associated with an absent you know bridging vein though so there is not going to be any bridging vein uh, but yes in most of the cases it is without a bridging vein but in some cases you can see a bridging vein between the left and the uh, right lsvc uh, in between the the left and the right svc and if there is a persistent left superior vena cava with an absent right superior vena cava then we call it as an isolated persistent left superior vena cava now in this case you will find mm -hmm. that there is a brachiocephalic vein which is or an innominate vein which is present but then like a normal left uh, you know left brachiocephalic vein takes blood from the left side to the right side you will find that this innominate vein is taking blood from the right side to the left side now diagnosis now there are uh, you know uh, you get when you are doing your regular fetal echo we are taking our four chamber view and we see the outflow tracks and we see the three vessel tracheal view now in the four chamber view and in the three vessel tracheal view there are certain findings which tell us that there is a possibility of a but the most commonest of all is what you see in the three vessel tracheal view you see it as a vessel to the left of the pulmonary artery and or you can call it as the fourth vessel in the three vessel tracheal view when there is a bilateral svc but a normal rsvc or you will find that it is appearing a little away from the aorta on color doppler the direction is important and in the four chamber view there are certain signs that we need to look for which i'll take you through now this is a three vessel view and you can see the pulmonary artery aorta the rsvc and you see a fourth vessel to the left of the pulmonary artery or the ductus arteriosus and this is the persistent left superior vena cava and you will also notice that in cases of bilateral svc that the rsvc is a little further away normally it is you know they are very very close to each other in a three vessel tracheal view you have the pulmonary artery the aorta and the svc again very very close to each other you will find because there is no interconnecting uh, 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 you know vein there and that is why you will find this to be a little far away and the size of the superior vena cava may be a little smaller than normal because uh, normally it receives blood from uh, the other side also but once there is a left superior vena cava that is going to drain directly in, into the coronary sinus then on doppler when you put in doppler so you are seeing one vessel when you put in color you will notice that the color in the rsvc and the lsvc is the same because 
the direction of the flow in both is the same. And so the direction of the flow in the LSVC is going to be the same as the RSVC and the direction of the flow is going to be craniocaudal. So it's going to be craniocaudal or the cardiopetal flow. In the four chamber view, you, you, will, you, you know, when you're doing a routine four chamber view, you can see a small bleb in the left atrioventricular groove. In the left atrioventricular, you can see if this bleb is because of the junction of the left superior vena cava and the coronary sinus. So this is one finding that you can see on the four chamber view. And another finding that you can see on the four chamber view, actually it is not in the four chamber view. This is a plane which is a little caudal than the four chamber view. You're going to find that there is a dilated coronary sinus. There is a dilated coronary sinus. Now this dilated coronary sinus is the coronary sinus you're not going to see in the plane of the four chamber view. You're going to see in the plane which is a little caudal that. So in that plane, you don't see the pulmonary veins opening into the four chamber view. And so that is the plane where you see the coronary sinus. And the what is you will find that the, there is another case here. You can see that this is the dilated coronary sinus there. And you can notice that the color flow. Now, the confusion always is, in fact, uh, quite a few cases which have come to me for an opinion where I picked up an LSVC was because it was labeled as a primum ASD. Now, the, that is why it is very important that way, you know, at what plane you are screening. And you will also find that in an ASD, the flow will always be from the right side to the left side, whereas in an LSVC, the flow direction is going to be from the left side to the right side. So that is one thing which helps you and say that this is a coronary sinus. So the flow in the coronary sinus is from the left side to the right side. And then you have the parasag views. And in the right parasag views, we get the bicable view. So you're seeing the RSVC and the IVC opening into the right atrium. But when you go into the left uh, parasag view, you will find the left superior vena cava. This is opening uh, into the coronary sinus. And then that goes and opens into the right atrium. Now, this happens in 92% of the cases. In 8%, it has, so eventually in 92%, the drainage is to the right atrium. And so hemodynamically, it is not making much difference. But in 8% of the cases, uh, the mm -hmm. drainage is to the left atrium. Now, this can happen if the coronary sinus is partially or completely unroofed. I haven't seen any case prenatally where I have been able to pick this up. But yes, that is one thing, or at times, you will find that the, the, the LSVC can open into the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary veins normally opening into the, after the LSVC has come and joined, it is can open into the left, it, it normally is opening into the left atrium. So there are two ways you can have a left atrial drainage. One is because of uh, an unroofed uh, coronary sinus, or you can have it because the LSVC is opening into the, pulmonary veins, and then into the left atrium. So this is that uh, tobacco pipe sign that is called where you see uh, in the, the left parasag, you would see the, uh, uh, the, the left superior vena cava opening uh, into the coronary sinus and eventually into the right atrium. And the direction of the flow is important. The direction of the flow is uh, from the uh, craniocaudal. So it is from the upper side towards the heart. So flow is towards the heart. Now, it's important that we know that uh, we, we are seeing the normal brachiocephalic vein. So why in, once you're crossing the three-vessel tracheal view and when you go up uh, more and more uh, cranially, you get the, uh, the left brachiocephalic vein and the direction of the left brach brachiocephalic vein is always from the left side to the right side. Now this, you know, I'm just trying to show this because now in bilateral SVC, in majority of the cases, you will find that the brachiocephalic vein is absent. So there is no brachiocephalic vein. 
So because anyway, the left side is draining. Otherwise, the left side eventually drains to the right superior vena cava through the left brachiocephalic vein. Now, because there is a drainage for the left side separately there, there is no need for that. So in majority of the cases, you're not going to find. But in some cases, the bridging vein can still be present. Now, when you have a LSVC, so you have a vessel to the left of the pulmonary artery, but there are only three vessels. So there is no fourth vessel. There are only three vessels, but the arrangement is different. So normally you have the, from the left to the right side, you will have the pulmonary artery, the aorta and the SVC. But in PL SVC with an absent RSVC, you have, the arrangement is different. From the left to right, you have an LSVC, the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Now here you can see, you can see the trachea on the, the, on the right side, but you're not seeing the right superior vena cava. And then you will also notice that the break, the innominate vein is present. There is an innominate vein, but now this is the left side and this is the right side. Now the direction of the flow you hear is from the right side to the left side because there is an LSVC, but there is no right superior vena cava. And that is the reason the flow from the right side is going into the left superior vena cava. And this eventually goes into the coronary sinus. And from the coronary sinus, it is entering into the right atrium. So eventually we are doing the same thing there. Now, this is another case where you can see that uh, you have uh, LSVC with an absent RSVC there. And again, you can see that the brachiocephalic vein is present and the direction of the flow is from the right side to the left side. Now, what happens is in LSVC, you will find that, you know, there is a slight disproportion in the ventricular sizes. The LV appears, the RV is a little larger than LV. The pulmonary artery is a little larger than aorta. Now these, you know, but these differences diminish with the gestation age. Now, uh, the hypothesis is that because there is a dilated coronary sinus, this may have an influence in the development of the fetal left heart structures. That is one thing. Or it can hamper, uh, you know, a sufficient uh, flow into the uh, left ventricle and hence the left cardiac output. And that is the reason you may find this kind of a discrepancy there. Now, what are the commonly associated cardiac anomalies? Now, this meta-analysis, which came in 2016, in fact, said that there are 60% of LSCCs were associated with CHD. And they talked about heterotaxy syndrome, the left ventricular tract, obstructive anomalies, conotruncal anomalies, shunt lesions, right-sided lesions, aortic arch anomalies, and AVSD was common in the heterotaxy group, and VSD and coarctation were common in the non-heterotaxy group, and coarctation of aorta is associated with LSVC in 21% of the cases. And they found extra cardiac anomalies seen in 31% of the cases and single umbilical artery was the most common extra cardiac finding and umbilical vein varix. But let me tell you that, you know, if you uh, look at the fine print of the meta-analysis, you will find that most of the data was derived from high-risk pregnancies. So most of the time, this was derived from centers which were dealing with high-risk pregnancies Hence, the rate of associated abnormalities is likely to be higher. So this is not coming from a regular. This, this data is coming from tertiary centers. They are anyway seeing high-risk pregnancies. They are anyway getting, uh, you know, uh, getting fetal echoes for cardiac anomalies. And that is suspected cardiac anomalies. And hence, this uh, incidence of CHD associated with left superior vena cava is very, very high. But let me tell you my own experience. Now, since 2017 to 21, we've had 98 cases of LSVC. That's the large number. This is an unpublished data because uh, you know uh, pub publishing becomes uh, in our areas become difficult because uh, genetic testing people don't agree to. Uh, autopsies are not commonly accepted, so most of the time. They either get terminated whenever we find something, and hence the, this is not a published data. But this is quite, uh, uh, you know, from what I could find. Now, out of the 98 cases, 72 cases were isolated. 
yes of course there is uh, you know six of them were associated with heterotaxy associated intracardiac anomalies were seen in 16 of the cases extra cardiac anomalies were seen in 20 20 cases out of uh, 98 of course some of these were had cardiac as well as extra cardiac anomalies and only one case of lsvc which was associated with avsd and had an increase nt in the first trimester that was the one which turned out to be trisomy 21 and but i don't know much about you know the incidence of aneuploidy in the other cases which had multiple anomalies because they got terminated and they did not uh, agree for uh, genetic testing there so in our center uh, associated cooptation so out of the 98 we had cooptation at the time of diagnosis so like you know all the predictors of cooptation at the time of diagnosis in three cases and uh, we had an uh, we absolutely normal heart at the time of the 19 week scan and then it there was an evolving cooptation in the third trimester in one case and uh, lsvc with an absent rsvc out of the five cases one of them was associated with heterotaxy one with chd because literature normally says that you have an lsvc with an absent rsvc they are they are the ones which are more commonly associated with cardiac anomalies but three of our cases were isolated there associated with with increase nt 29% of lsvc had an increase nt in the first trimester again this is a study from 2007 and why do you you know maybe the reason is that this increase nt could also be actually one of the markers of an associated congenital heart disease and hence every case of an lsvc that you see must undergo a fetal echocardiography even if the karyotype is normal even if uh, you know the end, the karyotype was normal there now let, let me just show you two three cases here like this is a three vessel tracheal view i am seeing only two uh you know a single great artery but then i am seeing the left superior vena cava and the right superior vena cava so bilateral scc there and this it turned out to be uh you know as you go up you, you will find that there is a, a vsd there is a sub pulmonic uh, vsd and you have a double outlet right ventricle which is happening there so you have a duo rv that's the pulmonary so this is Uh, a, a sub pulmonic uh, vsd that we have there and here you can see uh, another clip so this is a case of a double aortic arch and in uh, double aortic arch and you have a bilateral svc which is happening there another patient with a bilateral uh, svc and you know all the features but in the four chamber view you can see that there is a disproportion between the two ventricular size and of course this uh, aortic arch is very very narrow so this is congenital hypoplasia of the aortic arch in this was the case i was talking about 18 weeks 6 days there was bilateral svc normal four chamber view no disproportion no changes normal sized of uh, you know aortic arch everything was normal when this patient came for a growth scan at 32 weeks uh, you know there was a slight disproportion in the ventricular size not very significant as such but we uh, found that yes the aortic isthmus was pretty narrow with a z score of minus 4 but when you look at the you could find that there is a posterior shelf there and so you yeah, let let me show you the clipping there and there you can see there is a narrowing just distal to the uh, the the left subclavian artery and you can see the shelf sign there and what was also important was that there is a flow disturbance there is a flow disturbance that is making out with this we gave a strong suspicion for cooptation of aorta and this turned out to be cooptation after birth association with aneuploidy yes there is an association with trisomy 18 and trisomy 21 most of the cases have associated cardiac or extra cardiac anomalies so wherever there was an aneuploidy they have associated cardiac or extra cardiac anomalies now if this is associated with a conotruncal or an aortic arch anomaly you also have to take into consideration 2311 micro deletion and isolated lsvc there are very very occasional case reports which you find and hence isolated lsvc no sufficient evidence to offer prenatal testing prognosis it depends on associated chd and uh, extracranial anomalies 
also depends on the drainage type. So whether the drainage is into the right atrium through the coronary sinus or into the left atrium because of an unroofed uh, coronary sinus or because it is draining because of this opening into the pulmonary vein. Isolated cases, no clinical implications, serial scans to rule out co-optation, other evolving cardiac anomalies and postnatal echocardiography. So what is the differential diagnosis? Uh, postnatally, there's a lot of differential diagnosis of an abnormal vessel on the left side, but prenatally, what happens is because most of the time we see this because of a fourth vessel, uh, which is seen to the left of the pulmonary artery, and the, the most uh, closest differential diagnosis is the supracardiac TAP we see because this fourth vessel could be the vertical vein. And in those, of course, you will find all these uh, findings in the supracardiac TA PVC, but the fourth vessel in the 3VT view is also a uh, finding which you get in supracardiac TA PVC. And there you can see in the three vessel tracheal view, you are finding that there is a fourth vessel, but then look at the direction of the flow. The direction of the flow of the RSVC and this fourth vessel is opposite to each other. So because the SVC flows towards the heart and the RSVC, flows away from the heart and you will find that the SVC is dilated and there you can see in the four chamber view there is a twig sign so you have a you know <coughs> there are no pulmonary veins opening into that you can see a bald uh, posterior aspect of the left uh, uh, atrium there and you are seeing a brachiocephalic vein which is dilated now this is what happens. So eventually it goes and opens into the brachiocephalic vein and that goes into the RSVC. Hence the brachiocephalic vein uh, is uh, dilated and that is the reason the, SVC, the RSVC also in most of the cases gets dilated there. And uh, there you can see in the coronal section, you can find that you have the left brachiocephalic vein confluencing with the SVC there. So how do you differentiate between the two? Now, Fourth vessel is seen in both the cases uh, to the left of the pulmonary artery. Direction of the flow in LSVC is towards the heart. Here you have it towards the upper thorax. The left brachiocephalic vein in most of the cases absent. Here it is dilated and present. And in the RSVC is small or of normal size in uh, LSVC, whereas it is normal size or dilated in supracardiac TAP. We see one of the pitfalls that I want to tell you about Whenever you take the three vessel view, now this is an image which I'm showing you, which also which had a bilateral SVC. But just imagine if this vessel is not there and look at where I'm pointing the arrow. Because I, I have done quite a few cases which were sent as bilateral SVC, but you know, one thing you look at the level, the level of this vessel should be, I you know, usually it is at the level of the trachea. Uh, the LSVC in the three vessel view is in, at the level of the trachea or, but if you see this a little higher up, make sure that it is an LSVC with all the associated findings because this actually is the left atrial appendage. You get the left atrial appendage, which uh, comes in, uh, you know, part of the left atrial appendage is seen in cross section like this. So a fourth vessel in the three vessel tracheal view differentiate between LSVC and vertical vein of supracardiac TAPVC, look for associated signs, detailed fetal echo, detailed structural scan, genetic testing if associated anomalies, if it is isolated, counseling and reassurance, but serial cardiac evaluation to look for coarctation, evolving coarctation of aorta or other evolving cardiac anomalies and a postnatal echo may be suggested but the most important point is inform the parents to preserve this report. Tell them that after delivery, just don't throw this away. Keep it with you. When your child grows up and becomes sensible, give this report to the child or inform him that he has a bilateral superior vena cava or he has a persistent left superior vena cava so that anytime, anytime in life he requires any kind of a cardiac intervention or anything, even if you know, it has been neglected, he can inform the clinician that yes, I, I am a case, I, I was prenatally diagnosed to have a persistent left superior vena cava. Thank you very much.
should we take few questions if you, everybody is okay no okay. yeah yeah can we take questions here on yes yes uh, yeah so we have dr anirudh tutarni our uh, uh, incoming president of the marathwada chapter and of course everybody knows anirudh kulkarni one of the most popular speakers in the country and uh, so he is going to take us through the audience interaction or whatever what we call as the question answer session yes uh, see uh, most of i think dr tiran pravin sir has answered few questions from the chat box but still we have few left out and uh, can, i think those who have heard those talks anirudh you can still take them because a lot of people may not see the chat box if they are important okay, questions okay. let everybody hear about them so that's what i'm saying that a uh, few of those questions uh, already discussed although in the talks we will take them uh, so uh, dr balaji from nanded is asking is blep sign present in pl svc with absent right sided svc only or it can be seen in pl svc with normal right sided svc no no it can be seen with uh, normal so eventually it, it is the junction of the lsvc with the uh, coronary sinus so it is eventually as long as the coronary sinus is dilated and it is opening into the coronary sinus you are going to see it no problem i think this has been answered already but still uh, how to manage single umbilical artery isolated finding in pregnant woman over 35 years of age group does it warrant any additional testing no in isolated uh, if it is if you are sure that it is an isolated umbilical artery it is to be uh, left that way like yes rightly i think your take home message stated very clearly when we are going to label it as a completely isolated finding we do not require any additional testing for that matter Yes. How do you follow patients with persistent right umbilical vein? I think this also has been uh, stated very well during the talk, but still, uh, someone needs to summarize the findings. Yeah, the isolated cases uh, need not be worried about. If there is associated finding, then we have to think of other investigations. So you, you so you mean to say? Uh, uh you need to be very sure setting that it's completely isolated yeah because complete uh, the um, uh, cardiac evaluation should be very thorough and uh, each and every system should be surveyed very neatly so that you are no, you are not uh, leaving any other anomaly if you have done a scan at 18 19 weeks then yes a follow up at 23 weeks with fetal echo would be a good uh, yeah. idea yeah, yeah. is invasive testing advisable in isolated persistent right umbilical vein no no not required in isolated cases is not required um can i interfere sorry please, please, uh, please, please, basically i think uh, the message has to be sent very clearly this uh, program is basically to uh, normal variant and uh, things to be worried about as long as all these features which are isolated which are not associated with any other structural changes i think we need to consider them as a normal variant i i, I think that message has to go uh, get across that's what i think most most of the speakers have uh, rightly stated in throughout the talk but still because there are questions know, in the I chat know, box that no no that's what i mean we are reinstating it okay that's perfect so any machines settings that uh, you want to alter as far as uh, visualization of arsa yeah see uh, basically whatever the machine settings that are there for your fetal echo particularly when you are looking for the three vessel trachea view that is the same settings that will help you in evaluating only thing is sometimes we may reduce the pr because it may be little difficult to identify the uh, the uh, right subclave in artery and particularly when it is a aberrant right subclavian artery because it crosses across the spine so um, basically as far as the three vessel trachea view is concerned that is the same thing which we use wherever we have a doubt i would definitely love to do a, a coronal section of the upper mediastinum when when we say it's a arsa on uh, so do you want to uh, coat in all those individuals any additional uh, postnatal echo no i don't think so if it is an isolated one no 
unless the pay, the baby baby has got a, a dysphagia or a, because of the compression the idea that the pediatrician should be informed that there was an arsa which can be result, resulting in dysphagia when you when you when we get when we get arsa ah uh, please devil sir please go ahead yeah you know when you know very rarely when the ductus closes uh, postnatally you know if it is a cumulus diverticulum and uh, you you may have uh, you know sometimes uh, 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 pains and all taking place and that is where uh, we need to at times uh, give some importance to it otherwise nothing that is basically for alsa yeah alsa for alsa yeah so already stated during the talk if there are no soft markers should we look for arsa uh, it's a very tricky situation uh, i mean vice versa i mean if nothing is seen in terms of uh, soft markers i understand marker. i understand it's a, it's an important it's a tricky question in the sense see suppose if i don't have any other marker and if it is a low risk patient with there is no previous history of any aneuploidy or a previous history of any chromosomal abnormality or there is no cardiac abnormality i would definitely not look for an arsa but if there is something which is uh, which is a high risk pregnancy associated with congenital heart disease definitely i would look for an arsa so intentional sections intentional sections to look for arsa is required under those circumstances only yeah. i i have a different opinion on that sir. i feel that uh, if you you know uh, it is always better to keep it as a protocol uh, because that actually helps many a times otherwise you know if you start using it as a uh, optional this thing you may not go forward with uh, uh, because uh, so many times you know you have not taken the history properly you know what sir is saying in a very very ideal situation but i feel that and it honestly speaking does not take a lot of pains anyway you are taking these days we all use the three vessel uh, view and we all use color so it is always better that you know you just have to change the prf and because the easiest differentiating point is that an arsa will always be seen in the three vessel tracheal view you will see it in the three vessel tracheal view whereas a normal sub right subclavian will be seen after you have left the three vessel tracheal view so that actually really helps you the moment you have in, you are in your three vessel tracheal view and you change your prfs you are going to see it so it's better that i i would say good habits are always uh, better to have uh, it should be a part of your protocol as, as arsa is major soft marker should we not advise direct invasive testing in all those individuals see i i think uh, this is again and again being stated first and foremost thing, there is no nothing like a major and a minor soft markers see each soft marker has been assigned with a positive likelihood ratio and a negative likelihood ratio so based on that only you try to evaluate but then if it is an isolated one the purpose of uh, uh, doing all these things and identifying it as an isolated is to avoid an invasive procedure and whenever it is an associated or non isolated arsa definitely we need to advise them at least for a self free dna so i think uh, when you have an arsa it doesn't you need to you don't need to jump to an invasive procedure i don't think it is an uh, it's a good habit or a good recommended uh, protocol any any bimal uh, 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 sir please uh, pravit sir actually this which is uh, this 3.9 likelihood ratio which has come from the meta analysis in fact there were very few studies from for arsa in that and they were actually coming from uh, high end tertiary centers yeah. and i think that i feel once the new meta analysis come and in fact some of the studies which have come recently they have in fact isolated they have found no association at all no yes. so as you if at all the patient is very uh, conscious an nipt is the good option to give you what's very good so do we need to uh, do we need to uh, comment regarding uh, the findings and state that there is a arsa which is isolated one to pediatrician or a pediatric uh, cardiologist for that matter well, anyway you, if you suppose you find an isolated arsa you definitely mention it in your report but any any alert i mean nowadays more or less the moment you said something is there uh, there is a neurologist there is a pediatric cardiologist there is 
whole lot of team even there in the OT. They should be aware of. They should be aware of because of the, this kind of. I mean, as as we have discussed, even though we may not be doing any invasive procedure, but it can cause certain postnatal problems. So it is better that they are aware of. Uh, there is uh, there is one question: How to differentiate between TABVC vessel and PLSVC? To differentiate between TABVC vertical vein and uh, yes, LSVC. Yes, I yeah, I've actually I've shown that chart at the very end on that. Yeah, that yeah. yes, you will find that the direction of the flow in both uh, in the LSVC is going to be the same as that of the RSVC, whereas in TABVC vertical vein it is going to be opposite. And uh, so that is one important factor. Brachiocephalic vein in most of the cases of bilateral SVC will be absent. Here you will find it. And in uh, superior cardiac TAPVC, it will be dilated. The superior vena cava can also be dilated, whereas it is normal or small in bilateral SVC. Is there any difference in prognosis of PLSVC with absent RSVC and both SVC cases? No. Though see, there is literature, see, eventually prognosis will eventually depend upon what are the associated cardiac and extra cardiac abnormalities. So there is no difference. Lit literature, uh, uh, some literature had pointed out that an absent RSVC, LSVC with an absent RSVC was more associated with uh, cardiac abnormalities. But uh, then they, uh, there are so, so many cases which uh, later on, uh, you know, people came up with where uh, they had uh, a normal, uh, you know, just an isolated uh, uh, LSVC with absent RSVC. I had three patients uh, of that kind, you know, there's no associated abnormality. So it doesn't make any difference. Combination of PL, SVC with SC, single umbilical artery, what should be done? I mean, these are all arbitrary situations, but still, no, no, it is one of the, you know, the single umbilical artery is the most common extra cardiac abnormality that you find with uh, LSVC. Uh, I, I won't bother much about that because, uh, uh, you know, uh, that is, uh, there, as long as there is no other extra cardiac or cardiac abnormality other than a single umbilical artery, uh, I won't give too much of importance to that. I think Anirudh has... Uh, uh, you uh, he's back here. How, how to counsel patient in PLSVC? How to counsel a patient with persistent left superior vena cava? Now, uh, if, 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 if there are additional findings, of course, the counseling will be based on that. But if you find it isolated, yes, uh, you, you know, that is the time where you really have to give them some time because finally, anything related to the heart, if you are jotting down on paper, it is important that you sit and talk to them. So I normally would explain this to them and tell them that yes, normally uh, this left side is the one which closes very early in pregnancy, but sometimes it persists. It is it is not it, it is uh, it is seen in about uh, you know uh, less than one percent of the cases normally also, and because there is nothing associated, uh, only thing is yes there could be some evolving uh, abnormalities like a coarctation which could be seen later. But that could happen even with a normal uh, uh, scan uh, without an LSVC. In the, at you, there are times when you find a normal 19-week scan. Even if there is no LSVC, there, still you can find an evolving or coarctation or other cardiac anomalies later on. So that can happen otherwise also. So I think it is more about reassurance uh, because you, you don't want to go about uh, terminating pregnancies with uh, uh, LSVC. Shilpa, single umbilical artery in first trimester should be reported or not? And how to counsel the same? I think you have stated it very well, but still, uh, please you repeat the same again. Yes, uh, with, the, with the aim of our anomaly scan, now shifting to the first trimester anomaly scan, we have to evaluate the uh, umbilical arteries on TVS. Uh, so we can very well detect them. And if we find the single umbilical artery on the first trimester scan, in our scenario, what is recommended is that we have to go for combined screening because uh, we don't know that if it is having aneuploidy and that we may find the uh, other features of aneuploidy later in the pregnancy also. So we need to go for combined screening and then we have to again uh, ask for an early anomaly scan so that we can detect abnormalities uh, uh, there also. Uh, this is the protocol when we uh, see uh, SUA in the first trimester. Uh, 
then we have to report that because now we are uh, finding so many anomalies and detecting so many anomalies in the first trimester scan. So we have to look for the uh, umbilical arteries in the first trimester and report them if it is a single umbilical artery. For hemodynamic, for hemodynamic reasons, mm -hmm. what is the cause of association of left SVC with poor COA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, now there is a, a theory of, uh, uh, there is a hypothesis of, uh, you know, obstruction, where uh, because an LSVC is, uh, drains into the coronary sinus and the coronary sinus is dilated, that leads to reduced flow into the left ventricle, and that leads to the left-sided obstructive lesions. Now, that is, again, an hypothesis, which is uh, there. And so that could be the reason why this is, also, you know, more commonly associated with cooperation. So, in fact, most of the left-sided obstructions uh, are commonly associated with LSVC. How many weeks can we rule out for adaptation confidently? And what are its subtle other features? At what, yeah, how many weeks can we rule out cooperation? Uh, we can rule out only postnatally. You know, definitely, <laughs> because the quite, often, is, yeah. quite, quite often you may go to postnatally also. Yeah, even postnatally also, even with an echo, it is missed, and later on again after some time it can happen. So coarctation, the diag prenatal diagnosis of coarctation is very very tricky. So all these things that we talk about, that disproportionate ventricular size, the ischemic uh, narrowing, the ductus arteries to ischemic ratio and then all this flow disturbance, LSVC. Now, these are all predictors of coarctation at birth. So, see, we are not going to diagnose, you know, we are actually not able to diagnose coarctation as such. So, what is important is whether there is coarctation at birth and whether it would require a, uh, you know, management. Surgical, management and surgical correction. So, uh, uh, but yes, some findings like, a ventricular disproportion in the third trimester is not a very strong marker. But a ventricular disproportion, if you are seeing in the second trimester, yes, this is more likely to be uh, associated with coarctation. Then ductus arteriosus to ischemic ratio. You know, I can give a full lecture on that. But uh, these are all the signs. So there are many signs which are there. And more the number of signs, the chances of uh, developing coarctation at birth is high. But again, it is you have to be very, very careful as far as counseling cooperation is concerned. L with the false positive and false negative prenatal diagnosis of cooperation is very, very high. Actually, in Ravi's book, last sentence in cooperation of Iota is that 50% of the times we overdiagnose it. That is true. Uh, do do uh, we need to be confident enough in going further states that there is no arsa. No arsa sign. That is Bimal's sign. <laughs> yeah. You can say. When you don't find the arsa, you say no arsa. That's it. Okay. I mean, I mean is it uh, what, what I the think? No uh, arsa, the no arsa sign is a direct uh, sign to evaluate the normal right subclavian artery. So, what <laughs> Sir uh, was showing you that, yes, once you then go into the SAG, then you are going to see that there is a bifurcation. And the bifurcation, once you have seen the bifurcation, that means you have ruled out an ASA. So that is, uh, see, there are a lot of signs which keep coming, but then the gold standard is still the three vessel tracheal view. Combination of left SVC and CPC. Left what should we next? I mean, again, two, two markers, not isolated one. No, so what we get? No, 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 nothing. As, as long as there is nothing. Because see, uh, choroid flexor cyst is a marker for trisomy 18. Now, trisomy 18 in 99% of the cases is going to show you major abnormalities. So, you know, LSVC with the choroid flexor cyst, the best thing is you call them for, uh, for an echo at 23 weeks and you will find that anyway, there will be no choroid flexor cyst at that time. So, your uh, uh, counseling becomes easier. So, the combination of sing single umbilical artery with CPC then? Single with umbilical artery with CPC? Yes. I will give it some importance there, uh, you know. But then again, uh, maybe not rush to uh, uh, going into an invasive straight away. But yes, with this combination, I will spend a lot of time to look for anything subtle. 
any even an additional small VSD or anything, I would ask for uh, testing. What do you say, Shilpa? Yes, sir. It's a, uh, basically, it is more associated with trisomy 18. And at times we get features, but uh, of trisomy 18 mean early, but later also we can get these features. So we have to take this seriously and better go for either uh, if it's early, then go for dual marker or then quadruple if required. And patient is the, if after counseling, if patient is ready, then we can go for even self free also. I'm sorry, I actually thought LSVC first, and that's why I started the answer, then realized it was single umbilical artery. So I answered part of your question. Next. PLSVC with dilated coronary sinus. Yeah. What? PLSVC with dilated coronary sinus. What next? I mean, what next? Is what will happen? Yeah, in, in, uh, with 98%, 92% of the cases, you're going to see a dilated coronary sinus. No, no, no. What, what, what the what Shubhangi wants to ask is that PL SVC with direct coronary sinus. What should be the next step? Individual testing or just reassurance? No, no, no. It's the same thing because every time you see a PL SVC, you're going to see a dilated coronary sinus. So what we are talking about PL SVC isolated, there is no because that is for the dilated coronary sinus is a sequelae of the PL SVC. Draining into it because the uh, PLSVC is draining into the coronary sinus, it is dilated and it is eventually draining into the uh, right atrium. Uh, see, basically, what we need to do in this situation is to follow them up with the left heart, uh, the possibility of a left heart abnormality. So, if you find something like a 20 22 weeks, uh, you have a left a, a, a persistent left LVC. And at the same time, you have a dilated coronary sinus. You have to keep watching whether there is any changes are going to happen as far as the left ventricle is concerned and the outflow track. That's the only thing that we are going to persistently evaluate. So that's all from the chat box as far as question and answer is concerned. It was a wonderful audience <laughs> for that matter asking a number of questions out of which whichever were related uh, to the talks that we conducted, uh, we have taken into account. There are a few questions which were answered directly by Dr. TLN Praveen, sir. Now, thank you very much, all the speakers. It was a wonderful session altogether and wonderful audience in excess of 300 from all part of India. Uh, so it was uh, really a great session altogether from the SFT. Now it's it's over to Dr. Shilpa. Always the uh, Marathwada sessions are good. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. That, that's, that's your love, affection and care for all of us. And you have been always kind to us whether it's a physical event or an online event. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, vote of thanks. Yeah. Uh, so the last of the vote of thanks uh, I'll be doing. Uh, first of all, I'll cast my personal thanks. Uh, this is my last uh, meeting as Secretary of SFM Marathwada chapter. And I thank Kurana sir, Praveen sir, uh, Mohit and Sahani sir for giving me this opportunity. Uh, actually, during the course of these years, I really learned a lot uh, from these mentors, not only in academics, but also in also about the organization skill, how to arrange a meeting, how to arrange a conference, which I was totally unaware of. And thank you very much, my mentors, for the same. I also thank Dr. Sujit, Sarita, <clears throat> Rinku, and Veena, because all of us together under leadership of uh, Sahani sir could make the SFM Marathwada uh, uh, chapters, all uh, the academic activities very really successful. I want to thank uh, all the central office bearers of uh, SFM, uh, uh, our uh, central team from SFM, all our technical team, Vishal and his uh, colleagues, or our trade partners. I'm extremely thankful uh, to basically Praveen sir. Uh, as Sani sir has said, that Praveen sir has really a very emotional uh, attachment to Marathwada. And whenever we uh, like ask for Praveen sir and sir, he never says no to us. Uh, may it be uh, any activity like uh, sir, you always, always stand for SFM Marathwada and thank you very much sir, for that. I also thank uh, Sujit and Sani sir for uh, today's uh, wonderful and crisp lectures. Last but not the least, I thank all the attendees uh, who are here in spite of so much late uh, time. Uh, your large number uh, always inspire us to come out with really interesting topics. I thank you everyone for your presence. And uh, thank you all the attendees, all the faculties. Thank you very much. Uh, thank the trade as well as Vishal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And a special thanks to Dr. Ashok Kurana to, yes, for being thank a silent uh, spectator. Yeah.
he has been watching and you can see his messages of appreciation coming uh, wonderful choice of topics excellent presentation and great interaction great learning professor professor kurana is uh, back on the screen with his ever smiling face we would like Please. to uh, hear something from him oh the, you know i just came back on the screen to make sure the video was working correctly yeah. Uh, no, waiting I mean, for that is, request. You know, this has been a very yeah. unusual choice of topics, and I really congratulate the Marathwara team for choosing these topics. Uh, very few people venture into these topics, and yet we venture into these in everyday practice. And it's been discussed so fabulously, and I'm so glad the attendees got involved and asked every single possible question, and that we could uh, answer all of this. But I think the greatest achievement that we've done today is that we had over 11 overseas members. Um, attending this That's meeting. fantastic. That's this fantastic. is a monthly meeting. So I think if we continue this trend, um, there's no stopping SFM from emerging as the world leader for fetal medicine education. So my congratulations to uh, Dr. Bimal Sani, the entire Marathwada team, for Dr. T.L. and Praveen for leading us, and my best wishes to Anirudh for taking this forward with the new team. I look forward to lots of great academics. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. you. Good night. We are signing off from Aurangabad and wish you a great week ahead.